Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us in this session. We will be talking about consolidation and turnaround trends in Asia and how they are boosting demand for alternative capital in this region. But before we start, please allow me to walk you through a few housekeeping rules. For a better streaming experience, we highly recommend you to use Google Chrome on your laptop to access the Hubilo platform. During the live session, if you have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to send your questions anytime via the Q&A channel only, which is the second button on the right-hand side of the screen. We will try to address your questions during the live session or in a Q&A summary that will be put out on the Austria Asia website a few days after the summit. For those of you who may have colleagues who are unable to join us today, please subscribe to our newsletter. The recordings of all sessions will be available to event attendees around the morning time of the next day. So in this session, I'm very honored to have Mr. Edwin Wong, Managing Partner and CEO of Aries SSG. Edwin, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. For those of you who don't know Edwin yet, he is leading his team at Aries SSG, one of the largest alternative asset managers in Asia Pacific with about 7.5 billion US dollars in AUM. The company was previously known as SSG Capital until last year, New York listed Aries Management Corporation acquired its controlling stake, followed by the firm's branding, rebranding into Aries SSG. And Edwin himself is a seasoned investor focusing on special situations and private debt transactions, especially across Southeast Asia, India and greater China. And just two months ago, Edwin and his team closed their third secured lending fund at over 1.6 billion US dollars. Edwin, congratulations on the fundraise. Thank you. Thank you for the so for Lovely. And for today's conversation, let's start with the uh, big news. For your new fund, I wonder how much capital you've deployed so far since your focus is on Asia Pacific. Which markets have you invested more money in? Yeah, for our latest lending fund, uh, we have deployed a little over a quarter of the fund already, um, spread out across our core markets, uh, China, India. Um, uh, we've done, we actually did something in, in Australia as well. Um, so I would say China and India tends to be the bigger market, so more, more active there. And then kind of the, the, the balance is spread up between Southeast Asia and Australia. Lovely. And uh, so within Asia Pacific region, which market specifically do you consider to be the biggest one right now for special situations and alternative capital players like yourself? I think if you look at special SID or, or maybe distress, um, India probably is the largest market uh, in, in, in terms of absolute size. Um, that has to do with the fact that the country is just that much more stress. Uh, it's a large economy, but it has gone through a fair bit of stress, uh, stress in the last many years, uh, even pre-COVID, um, the amount of uh, stress assets in the banking system has been quite large already. And obviously, COVID has, has uh, taken uh, the numbers to a, to a new level. So um, we have seen already <clears throat> in the last 12, 18 months, a lot of activity in that country. And we expect that to continue for quite some time to come. Um, I would say a close second will be China. Um, China is going through a very interesting phase right now, and and again, especially on the stress, the stress side, I think that opportunity set has really opened up. Um, what you've seen, um, I would say, right, I guess what's grabbing the headlines almost every day now, it's it's something that we have not seen uh, in the past, which is you know companies. Um, uh, trading as if they're going to be the uh, 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 restructured, uh, meaning uh, the number of, of companies um, um, that needs restructuring, it's, it's going to be quite significant. Uh, again, in the past, most companies ended up getting some sort of bailed out. So the need for uh, or the, the, the event of a default and ultimately a restructuring tends to be uh, less of a common thing in the past. I see. 
Um, so I wonder, in our previous in interview last September, you mentioned great potential in the real estate and financial services sectors in India and China. Has your team managed to capture any, say, quality deals in these areas that you could share with us today? Has there been any change in these opportunities or any other new industries that you are looking out for these days? I think those two sectors continue to be where we're, we're more active in, um, in the financial sector, especially last year. Um, again, when, when COVID hit, banks were going through a lot of, or banks and, and non-banks, we're going through a lot of financial difficulty. Um, so the ability to step in and provide capital solutions for them was one of the main themes for us. So we have been very active uh, investing across banks, non-banks, um, you know, whether it's, and it's really, uh, it involves buying good assets, buying non-performing assets, or even putting equity into some of these companies. So that has been, a very big theme for us, and that has done extremely well today. Um, real estate is another one that I mentioned, and I think that continues to throw up a lot of opportunities. Uh, and that is really across the region. Um, clearly, post COVID or during COVID, um, there are that there are just that many more distressed assets out there on the real estate side. And you look at Southeast Asia, for example. Um, whether you look at residential, whether you look at hospitality assets, um, in general, that sector is rather depressed. Uh, if you look at India, again, India, the real estate sector was distressed even before COVID. Uh, if anything, the market is actually uh, rebounding or getting a bit of life now, given some of the, um, the policy initiatives. So we're actually seeing some, some healthy recovery uh, in, in parts of that country. Um, China, again, we talked about it already. It's a huge opportunity in our view, um, looking at where things are right now. Um, the amount of debt that has been raised um, and the amount of restructuring that is likely to have to occur to, to kind of uh, uh, resize the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sector. Um, I think that that itself is a huge opportunity for people that uh, are familiar with uh, understanding how to look at these credits because they're actually quite complicated and understanding the nuances around being onshore and offshore and all your all the rights or lack of rights that you have. Understood. I, I want to zoom in a bit. You mentioned about the rising opportunities you are seeing in the market, but at the same time, we've been dragged onto pretty much the second year of the pandemic. I wonder, you started Aries SSG in 2009 as an investor who has weathered several market downturns. How do you strike a balance between, say, making new investments versus providing downside protection to your portfolios? I think the one thing that uh, we prioritize, uh, if anything, it's, it's the risk that we have on the books. Um, so if anything, the focus, if you look at our internal meetings and whatnot we always start with what risks we have and how we how do we manage them before we talk about pipelines um so the most important thing for us is manage our risk well before we start thinking about adding more risk to the to uh to the book so that's kind of the philosophy that we have as a firm um so everyone on the team is very again whenever we have meetings the first thing we talk about okay what's on the book and how do we how do we manage them through um, and that has been, uh, uh, again, having been an investor since the Asian financial crisis, we have certainly gone through a number of cycles and ups and, uh, and, ups and downs. So I think we, we were, we're sitting here today feeling pretty good about the opportunity set. Um, again, you have to have the ability to weather, to, to know how to work out certain assets that are less, that are, that are underperforming. Um, and that's just that is just a, a part and partial of the experience that you accumulate over the years um and and also be be i mean one of the beauty that we have is we are very very local in terms of our setup uh, we operate out of nine different offices um so as COVID came and and hit the region we're fortunate in, enough to have actually people on the ground that can hold the hands of our borrowers and, and be able to navigate 
kind of the, the crisis with them. So that has been a big help. Uh, so the local team not only, again, not only originate and, 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 and execute new transaction, a lot of their time was actually asset managing what we have with the, uh, with the companies on the ground. You focus a lot about having local team and local professionals with the expertise of the market. I think that's a very important part. I just wonder, since you are based in Hong Kong, you and your team, like specifically how much proportion, if we can quantify that, you are currently spending on downside protection versus making new investment. And when it comes to downside protection or trying to add value to your portfolio, what value add do you consider as the most needed by your portfolio companies these days? Uh, in terms of um, time spent, I would say, I mean, again, different uh, in terms of different individuals, but I would say as a firm, probably I would say, you know, 30, 40% of the time is spent on risk management across the team versus kind of funding new, new transactions. Uh, again, bearing in mind, we're more credit oriented. So, uh, so uh, ideally, or hopefully, when you make a loan, they, um, they should not be very, they should not incur a lot of brain damage on day one. Uh, or at all, um, because that that certainly would not be part of the underwriting thesis. Um, so, it's, so for the for the performing side of our strategy, um, you know, we do talk to the companies. You know, we check them on a regular basis, but that should be much lower maintenance. Um, the distress stress part of the of the of what we do is where we spend the more time on asset management. Um, so overall, I would say again, maybe you know, around 40% would be the right number in terms of how much time we spend on kind of managing the book. Um, to your second question around, I guess, um, what do we do when we asset manage? Um, first and foremost, and especially during COVID, is just making sure we're in touch with them. Um, the kind of, um, there's a lot of bouncing of ideas um, it could be capital related. It doesn't have to be. I mean, we are, we have been invested in many of these, these countries, these sectors um, that we, I think we have a lot of touch points. We have a lot of things that we can share to these companies, um, uh, especially what we saw in the previous cycles and whatnot. Uh, and we have also a lot of relationship that we can introduce to help, whether it's upstream or downstream. So though all, all those are things that we try to do to kind of stabilize um, and give them advice uh, as things becomes a little bit volatile. Um, capital, obviously, it's a, it's, a, it's a big thing of what we do in terms of, you know, doing, you know, figuring out the financial engineering part, seeing how we can help the, uh, stabilize the companies by pro pro providing or injecting more capital. Um, that is obviously the, the, the capital side of the equation, but I would say a lot of, a, what we do is beyond just providing capital. We do spend a fair bit of time working, the, working, especially on the restructuring side of things, you know, providing whatever advice we can around the businesses. You know, in some cases we do, we do work on right-sizing the capital structure, taking out some of the non-core assets and potentially even, you know, kind of replacing operating management. Understood. I just want to switch gears a bit to some big picture questions. Well, many thought there would be an increased demand for private credit solutions during the COVID, but data from Prequeen shows private credit in Asia has suffered a virus-induced slowdown, with the aggregate private debt raised in the region being only 2.7 billion US dollars so far this year. I wonder what's your read of the data? Um, I would rather not comment on the data because as, you, as we all know, data in Asia tends to be very choppy. Um, mm -hmm. I think if the question is around maybe, again, credit in general spreads across performing, non-performing, yeah? So uh, if we're, I think on the performing side last year, probably the fundraising has not been as robust uh, as it could have been. Uh, again, I think we did a fantastic job raising a lot. You know, our, uh, our latest lending fund was more than double the size of our last one. So. So we continue to do well on the on that side. I think two things probably affected 
fundraising. Uh, one is just people couldn't travel. Um, you know, Asia is still a place where people would prefer to come and look at the managers and sit at the offices and meet the team. Uh, for managers that are perhaps lesser known uh, or smaller, um, the appetite for the big uh, LPs to invest without doing the side visit is going to be very limited. Uh, so that probably had something to do with that. Um, I think in the early part, of the, in, I guess in, in a, for a good part of 2020, you also had a phenomenon where because it, 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 it was a global pandemic, um, the, the, the pricing for developed markets actually widened out initially. Um, so as a relative value, uh, one thing that people love about Asia is you know, just less competition, better pricing, and so on and so forth. But when things in, in, in Europe and in, in, in the US were, you know, were widening out because of the pandemic, then naturally people would say, well, I'm, I'm getting that kind of yield in my, in my backyard. Why would I need to go farther out? So that was the case early on in the pandemic. That's not so much the case anymore because again, the U actually snapped back uh, to uh, to very tight levels um, shortly after that. Um, so I think traveling was a big part of it. Uh, again, for people for the smaller managers, it's just very hard for people to get comfortable with unless they come and visit and do the, the do the onsite. It makes sense. Indeed, the travel restrictions, quarantine requirements have posed on challenges when it comes to investments or portfolio management. I just wonder what about the restructuring experience during the COVID with all the obstacles in doing the whole process. When it comes to your personal experience, can you share a bit on the restructuring side of the business? Yeah, I think what I the biggest impact is, well, I guess it's two impact. Uh, one, just whether it's restructuring or not restructuring, the business side of things did get impacted. Um, you know, top line, the uh, you know, EBITDA all of a sudden just went away. Um, so those type of situ situation makes a restructuring very hard because frankly, you don't really know what to restructure until you have some sort of stability. So that is one part of it. And you just have to kind of you know, the, the storm has to clear to some degree for everyone to kind of agree on a set of projections going forward, right? So that's the first part. And then you also have issues around the, the court systems because um, in some cases courts were just closed. So even, with, even if, when you're pursuing uh, a, a restructuring or even an enforcement, um, when the courts are closed, it will just delay the process. Um, so those are the two things that I would say was, was probably more obvious. Um, but again, now in Asia, one thing to, to highlight, even though COVID is not, when, you know, we're not out of the woods yet, I would say by large, most of the economies are working through COVID now. So I think we've all find a way to kind of get back to business, even though COVID is still very much you know, uh, around us. Yeah, so I agree with you. I just hope this COVID can finish soon. Um, you mentioned a bit about the cross-market comparison. So Asia as a whole, we saw the year-to-date amount of private lending in the region uh, fell short of Europe's and uh, North America. I just wonder, what do you think are the major impediments holding back a faster growth of this strategy in this part of the world? Uh I actually think the demand has picked up and I, we are seeing very, very healthy demand coming into the region. Um, and um, many LPs are talking to us. I mean, we are, uh, so we are see, actually seeing very strong demand, um, especially on the distress special set side, because it's very clear um, that opportunity set is unique in Asia and that opportunity is not going away anytime soon. So on that side of the equation, the demand is actually very, very strong. And we have seen over the last five years or so, uh, more and more, you know, big global managers, uh, or big global LPs, I should say, uh, have really started shifting money into this, into this strategy in Asia. Um, 
in terms of what could make the the region even more the um, uh, appealing to to investors um i guess the rule of law the the the, the, the i think has it's it's has already advanced a lot in the last 20 years, um, but clearly there's still inefficiencies in the system. So again, it sometimes it takes a bit of education um, for investors um, without the, the the background in Asia to get up to speed as to how you actually underwrite a credit, how you actually enforce or restructure. Uh, so that that takes a little bit of learning. Yeah, since we are seeing a rise in LP demand to invest in Asia, I wonder, are you seeing any like more fund managers in Asia looking to potentially tap this segment as supposedly the demand should be increasing and especially the credit tightening by traditional banks? Yeah, I think you're already seeing um, a lot of global managers coming out here and, and, and looking to, to build some sort of presence in the region um that trends probably started three four years ago and uh, i mean to date aries ssg is clear it's 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 definitely not the only one telling people that there's a big opportunity in asia almost all the big brand names have started putting a team together you know come out and you know put up put up put up an office in the region uh, so all of them in fact many of them are looking to raise their funds uh, uh, for this asset class uh, so we actually see quite a bit of uh, demand from from global managers coming to the region to um, to replicate uh, what we've done. Are you talking about first time fund managers or are you talking about legacy fund management companies that are just coming to this part, but they already have um, operations in other parts of the world? No, I think we're, well, I'm referring to the very, very large global names that have i mean many of them are very private equity focused um they do have debt but more so in in europe and in in the us and they're really building up a credit presence in the region so that is again almost all the names that you can name they are or building credit right now so every one of them is seeing a big opportunity right in front of us so personally, do you feel there is an increased competition in the market? Do we have enough opportunities around for everyone to get a share from it? I think the the competition is something that we always see. That's never been a big issue. I think uh, if you look at, again, just a little bit of history, um, some of the foreign firms come and some of the foreign firms leave as well. Uh, I think one of the, I guess, challenge of, of 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 doing this in asia is is the barriers of entry is quite high um so unless you are committed to the region uh and that will be a multi-year commitment it is hard to build scale um because again asia is not one particular country it's many different countries so you have to have local people local offices um local licenses and experience all that takes years to build so you know for those that are committed and it's and it's and it's uh and it's and it's prepared to be here for for many many years i think they would do very well uh, mm -hmm. some think it some are probably coming in thinking it's it's easy and it's and it's, it's never easy easy so there will be people that leave and again we've all we've seen that kind of miracle round some come some leave and some come again Indeed. Since you are particularly interested in markets like China and India, um, these two countries where regulations around special situations are still evolving despite their general benign attitude towards further opening up to foreign investors, I just wonder how do you navigate the local markets in China and India? Um, I think they're quite, I wouldn't say they're not open to foreigners. Um, again, you have to have the right infrastructure to be efficient around how you invest. But I think those, both of those countries very much want to attract foreign capital. Um, and um, I mean, we are, again, we, we put a lot of money to work every year in those two countries. Um, and they recognize that, that 
um, there is need for alternative capital. I think one thing that is clear, there's only so much that the banks can do. So alternative credit managers like ourselves actually have a lot of lot of um, room to navigate um, because banks do certain things and they and again uh, they're rather rigid in terms of what they do and what they don't do. Um, so it is actually quite an open playing field for people that are experienced uh, and knowledgeable in terms of how to how to um, make investments in those markets. And what about your, the Southeast Asian opportunities you are seeing as compared to other jurisdictions in Asia? The Southeast Asia markets um, are different. Number one, they're smaller, um, but the markets are more concentrated, meaning the wealth is more concentrated to a, a, a smaller list of families, let's put it that way. Um, so it's easier to cover in that sense. And we have been investing in in uh, in in Southeast Asia for you know, almost 25 years now. So we tend to know a lot of people there and it makes it easier for us. Uh, one thing that we're quite focused on is the distress opportunity there also. Um, again, banks have a lot of MPLs and we are um, kind of the go-to guy in terms of providing a solution around taking taking some of that MPLs off the banks. Um, so we are in, in in direct dialogue with some of those institutions to see whether we can be helpful around doing some sort of JVs or taking some of the, the, the being helpful around some of the MPL solution. Okay. I just wonder, there are so many jurisdictions within Southeast Asia as well. Are there any particular markets that interest you more? I think Southeast Asia for us, I, I'll answer it this way. We're more active in places like Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam. Um, that's not to say we we don't look at. I mean, we do. We're looking at something in Malaysia right now. We have looked at Philippines, for example. But again, those markets are a bit smaller. Um, we are probably not as active in the very pioneer um, the countries. Um, so I think we tend to stick to places that we know we have people on the ground and we're very very familiar uh anything more frontier i would say probably less likely for us understood uh since we have a few minutes left i'm opening the floor to q a from the audience and we have one question coming in in terms of the market in india are you seeing huge opportunities around special situations yes i think we have um just to uh, as a factual data point, uh, we have actually been active in acquiring a lot of loans uh, from banks and non-banks. Uh, we continue to see that as a big opportunity set um, as um, these institutions um, look to dispose these, uh, these, these assets either because of liquidity or it just too much brain damage for them to hold it hold on to their institutions. Um, so we see, in fact, we're looking to buy something even today. Um, so we have a lot of bilateral discussion going on uh, in terms of, you know, being able to acquire, you know, these non-performing loans from these institutions. So that is a big thing. Uh, again, you have, you need special licenses to do these things. Uh, you need to have people to understand how to work them out and restructure them. Um, so it's, in that sense, it takes a lot more alpha. It takes a lot more expertise rather than just pricing a new note. Okay. Another question is also on Indian market. Uh, what are the hurdles do you face in India? Will you be investing or buying distressed debt from banks set up in the country? Would we be buying assets from the banks in the country? Yes. Uh, yeah, the answer is yes, we have, and we will continue to do that. Um, again, we're looking to do something with the bank even today. Um, okay. So it's a, it's an active part of the, again, you're looking at a banking system that has, that is forecasted to have NPL ratios in the, in, in, in the double digits. So imagine the size of the opportunity. So I, I think it's, it's something that we'll continue to be active in. Maybe a follow-up question to that. So when it comes to your team and yourself, how much proportion of the team's uh, time, energy, or money-wise is going to be devoted to the Indian market in the next three to five years? Uh, uh, the, if you look at our, 
the investment professional, I would say, I mean, we have a lot of people on the ground in India. Um, you know, our team, I think as of today, is probably around 19 people on the ground. We also have an affiliated, affiliated servicing company that has 40 plus people on the ground. Um, so just in India, people sitting in India, you're looking at, you know, probably closer to 70 people right now. Um, and then that's also our Indian risk is supported by people in Hong Kong and Singapore as well. So the amount of bandwidth we have around that country, it's significant. Um, you know, that compares to China, which we have, again, probably somewhere around closer to 20 people. Um, so it, in there, again, Part of it is also because we have a service and company, so that takes a, that has a lot of people in it. But it is, it is a country that has a lot of bandwidth. Understood. And you touched a bit point on the Australia market, which is your, you're also looking these days. Anything particularly interesting in Australia? Yeah, we are we are very focused on developing the unit tranche market in Australia. This is sponsor lending, uh, something that we feel it's really it's it's relatively untapped um so we are that is one thing that we're very excited about uh, we have um some very senior resources you know focusing on that market opportunity set right now in australia okay and apart from the overall pan asian market opportunities are there any other markets elsewhere that you can share a bit of your uh, opinions on when it comes to special situations, private credit lending? Well, one thing about us is, uh, at SSG is we, we've, we're very focused on what we're good at and, and we also know what we're probably not, not the expert <laughs> in. So when it comes to anything outside of Asia, I'd rather, I'd rather stay silent. Lovely, super dedication on that. Uh, maybe just one last point on that since we're running out of time as well. Um, the company just closed its third fund on secret lending. Uh, is there anything that you could be comfortable to share with us in terms of new fundraising plan? Well, we're, um, uh, I'm not, uh, the, I don't have the liberty to talk about fundraising plans. <laughs> All I can say is our, our work, we're constantly in touch with our investors. Uh, we have a lot of ideas. They have a lot of appetite. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Lovely. Thank you so much for today's session. And uh, wonderful to have you, Edwin. And thank you, everybody, for dialing in and listening to this session. Uh, please be noted and always stay tuned to our newsletter. We will soon post a recording of this session the next morning uh, through the email. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Edwin. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye-bye.